Um, after really cool sessions this morning about Ebola and fungal diseases, we will now switch gears towards a plant pathogen, citrus screening disease, or Huolong Bing disease, which has been affecting orchards on the East Coast in Florida, most notably, and also in other parts of the world, and also has spread to California. Um, it's a devastating citrus disease that kills plants within a couple of years, and um, I'm very glad to have some great speakers on the subject today. Um, one of them is Melanie Barnett from Stanford University, and she has pioneered a high-throughput campaign um, to find new methods to combat citrus screening, and I'm looking forward to her talk. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Julia, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm glad to be here, and thank you to the organizers and the sponsors. And I also want to thank uh, my boss, Professor Sharon Long, whose picture is there. She wanted to be here, but she's teaching the first class of her microbiology laboratory for freshmen, uh, pretty much right now. Um, and then at the bottom there, you see our uh, funding. OK, so citrus greening, like Julia said, it's also known as Wang Long Bing or um, HLB. And citrus greening is caused by Candidatus libidobacter asiaticus. It's a gram-negative bacterium. And it is spread to uh, citrus trees by sap-feeding Asian citrus psyllids, um, or diaphorini citri. And today, I'm going to talk about mostly the bacterial side of things, because that's what our project most closely um, relates to. Uh, my fellow speakers are going to talk more about um, the disease processes and the plant um, bacteria interactions and the effects, so I'm not going to really go into that, but I did want to give just one quick background slide just to kind of, you know, go over a little more on the devastation of the disease. And um, basically, this is a really destructive disease. Um, once the plant is infected, it spreads throughout to, to every, you know, affects every organ of the plant, the roots, the fruit, the leaves. Um, like Julia said, the plants die pretty um, rapidly after they have the disseminated infection. Um, the fruit is not salvageable. Basically, it drops early. It's extremely bitter. Um, there's no cure. Um, basically, that's what happens to the tree. The trees are just dug up, destroyed. Um, and it's cost, so far in the US, probably at least five or six billion dollars, and that's without any spread to commercial orchards in California. So most of the economic losses have been in Florida so far um, since 2005. So um, in the United States, uh, it's mostly liber it's, in fact, it's all Liberobacter asiaticus, which is the causative agent of citrus genie. There are two other um, species in the world but uh, of Liberobacter that affect citrus, but I won't go over those. I want to give a little bit of background on the alpha proteobacteria. This is the diverse, fascinating class of bacteria to which Liberobacters belong. And you can see from this non-inclusive list up here that there's just many different kinds of bacteria. You have your uh, free-living aquatic bacteria. For example, Pelagibacterales um, make up 25% of the planktonic uh, life in our oceans. Um, a lot of alpha proteobacteria live in the soil, such as um, Azosporillum, which is a plant growth-promoting bacterium. A lot of interest in that lately um, because it can fix nitrogen and reduce the need for nitrogen fertilizers. Um, our favorites here, um, Sharon's lab works on these nitrogen fixing plant symbionts and I'm going to talk a little bit more about those in a bit. We got your arthropod associated, your mammalian pathogens. We had some that are both mammalian pathogens and arthropod associated. And then finally, plant pathogens like Agrobacterium and the Libirobacters. Now within the alpha proteobacteria, there's a family, the Rhizobiaceae. 
And this is the one, the, the family that our favorite bacterium, Cynorhizobium mellodi, belongs to. And at the top right there, you can see uh, Cynorhizobium mellodi in its plant habitat. It is a free living soil bacterium, but it can infect the plant roots and form these structures. It induces the plant to form these structures. It's kind of like a house for it. Um, the bacteria invade the roots, make these nodules. The cross section there is a cross section of a nodule, and each of those enlarged plant cells is just filled with thousands of differentiated um, cyanorhizobium bacteria. Um, another bacteria in this family is agrobacterium, for example, agrobacterium tumefaciens, which causes um, crown gall disease of dicot plants, so literally thousands of different species of plants can be affected by these disease. And then the Libirobacters, of which there are, I think now maybe about seven species. Um, Libirobacter asiaticus is the prime um, pathogen causing citrus greening disease, but there's also, like here on the bottom, um, Libirobacter solanaceus serum, which infects potatoes and other solanaceous plants, um, causes zebra chip disease, because if you try to make these into potato chips, they look like zebra chips, that's where the the name comes from. And so um, these three genera of bacteria are all you know, closely related, yet they also have some really um, interesting differences. For example, Cyanorhizobia and agrobacteria, they have very large multipartite genomes, you know, multiple replicons, um, whereas the Libirobacters tend to have very reduced genomes, you know, probably part of their evolutionary history as being intracellular, um, obligate intracellular bacteria. Um, the Cyanorhizobium and Agrobacterium are actually workhorses for the alpha proteobacteria. They're major model systems for the study of, of this group of bacteria. Um, whereas all Libirobacter so far, except for Libirobacter crescens, are unculturable. So it's really difficult to work with Libirobacters um, in the lab because you basically can't grow Libirobacter asiaticus in the lab. There's actually been a, a recent development, uh, just published very recently. They're able to maintain Libirobacter asiaticus for two years in a mixed biofilm culture where Libirobacter asiaticus appears to be by 16S sequence reads about one read for every 100,000 of all the other bacteria in the mix. So that's kind of the best we're, we're doing now. So when we, you know, this disease was emerging, Sharon had the idea, is there anything we can do to leverage our great model bacteria, one for which Sharon's lab has 40 years about of experience working with, um, to basically discover a way to inhibit Libirobacter asiaticus function. So can we take our cyanorhizobium and use it to study Libirobacter? Um, so in talking about how to inhibit Libirobacter asiaticus function, maybe the first thing that comes to mind, because we're talking about bacteria, let's just take some antibiotics. Can we spray trees with antibiotics? Well, actually, we can. <laughs> And you guys may have seen this. It was in the New York Times this past spring. So um, growers in Florida now have permission to spray oxytetracycline and streptomycin, so broad-spectrum antibiotics, on citrus trees. Now, um, and some folks think that's a bad idea, like scientists at the CDC and the FDA really um, fought against this, but the EPA won out. Um, and there is some question, does it even work? Um, the literature, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but the literature seems to show that if you can actually inject the antibiotics into the trees, you have a much better chance of helping ameliorate the disease than if you spray, which makes sense, right? You're trying to get something into a big tree and the bacteria are inside it. Um, well, anyway, so we didn't want to just try to find things that would like kill Libirobacters because we um, thought that's gonna create problems with um, spreading antibiotic resistance maybe in the environment or killing off beneficial bacteria. So we decided to take a more um, targeted approach 
And this is kind of similar to what um, Anders and Hyleen talked about with the, the fungal uh, approaches to fungal diseases, right? You're targeting a specific, um, specific pathways. And so our assay that we developed is based on the premise that at least some transcription activators in Liberobacter asiaticus probably turn on pathways or regulatory circuits that control either virulence or survival in the citrus plant host. And so I'm gonna go over this uh, schematic in a little, take a little time to do it because I'm gonna show you others later on as I get into more of the details. But basically the way this works is we have our SML load I cell there, you know, the big blue thing, and it is expressing a gene that encodes a Liberobacter activator protein on a plasmid. And we postulated that because they're so closely related, this activator gene would probably be able to activate some promoters in the S melodi genome. And that if we could identify such promoters, then we could create some sort of construct where we have the promoter fused to an enhanced green fluorescent protein gene, that's the green uh, block there, and that would give us a way to screen for things that inhibit the activity of that regulator, right? You get rid of the regulator if it's turning on fluorescence, making the cells glow, you inhibit it, they're not gonna glow anymore. Um, so that was kind of our idea. And then you can also, when you're doing this, take into account whether the cells are viable or not, right? So that's how you kind of get away from this selective pressure killing the cells. So initially we chose seven Liberobacter transcription factors for analysis in SML lodi, and our criteria for choosing these were that they're expressed more highly in diseased plant than in the insect, that they come from diverse protein families who don't want to study just one type of regulator, and also we favored those that were implicated in SML lodi symbiosis because that suggests that there's a possible function that relates to life in the plant. And I'm not really gonna go over this in detail, but these are the seven that we chose. And I just wanted to um, point out a couple things, you know, different regulator families there in the middle column. And also the VIS-NR, those in SML Lodi, we know they function as a heterodimer to make one you know, multi-subunit protein that binds promoters. And so we figured it would be the same in Liberobacter. So I'm gonna give a couple examples later on highlighting the VIS-NR results, and I'll just refer them to VIS-NR, but it's actually two genes there. Okay, so here's our synthetic platform that we designed. So first, we have to figure out how to express the Liberobacter genes in SML Lodi because they do have very different codon usage biases. You know, SML lodi tends to be, its DNA is more GC rich, whereas the Liberobacters are more AT rich. So we optimized the genes, we had the DNA synthesized, we cloned it into plasmid um, with an inducible LAC promoter so we could turn the expression of the gene on that plasmid there in the pink, we could turn it off and on and modulate the level of expression. And then we used S smell lodi host strains that were deleted for the orthologous S smell lodi regulator. So for instance, S smell lodi does have a VIS-NR. I just told you that. Liberobacter appears to have one. We gotta get rid of the S smell lodi VIS-NR to reduce our background expression for the genes. And so once we had that strain um, with the regulator on the plasmid, we could use, um, you know, basically grow the cells, induce them so we're turning on the regulator. Then we purify the RNA from those cells, make copy DNA, cDNA, and we use that we hybridized that to a custom Affymetrics gene chip. We could have also done just direct you know, RNA-seq 
sequencing if we wanted to do that. So that's how we identified which SML load I genes are turned on by the regulators. And then, because SML Lodi is a really nice um, bacterium for study, we have a lot of genetic tools. One of the tools we have is we have mapped every transcription start site, well, every one that we could um, in the genome. This was done as an international collaboration with Anka Becker's group in Marburg, um, Germany, which I'm excited. This is the second time Marburg has come up. Um, and I've seen the building, actually, there. there's a building there that has Marburg virus like art on the side of it that's really cool because that is, as we learned this morning, where they discovered that virus. Um, but anyway, OK, diversion. So using this transcription star side data, we could actually figure out where the promoters for those genes that were turned on by the Liberobacter, um, where they are located. Um, and that helps a lot in making an efficient you know, expression construct. And all Liberobacter regulators appeared to be functional SML loci um, in that everyone activated expression of at least some RNA transcripts. Liberobacter RPOH, LDTR, and VizNR activated the most, and those are the ones we ended up using for our high throughput screen. And so, you know, we have our promoters. Here are the screening strains that we developed. Um, and basically, so the premise is, and what we ended up doing is we ended up, we didn't want to have too many plasmids. So we ended up putting both the um, inducible, the express regulator, and the promoter EGFP fusion on the same plasmid. And we just kind of um, cordoned them off with transcription terminators so we didn't have to worry about transcription you know, coming from you know, where we didn't want it. Um, so basically, with the LAC promoter, right, you may remember that it's repressed unless you have the inducer IPTG. So you add IPTG and release the repression, and then that allows the um, promoter to drive expression of your activator, and then that turns on um, the expression of EGFP and the cells fluoresce. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of those. So the first example is just a plate assay that shows that Liberobacter VizNR promotes expression of an EGFP reporter gene fusion. So when we did the Affymetrix chip results, we saw that Viz, Liberobacter VizNR activated expression of the SMLI REM gene. So we took the REM gene promoter, hooked that up to EGFP, and then we showed only when you have both the promoter, PREM, and IPTG, do you see the cells glow. So that's pretty simple. Um, but we got to make sure that it works uh, in 384 well plates, because that's how we're going to do the screening. So this graph shows EGFP fluorescence on the y-axis, and just duplicate sets of 384 well plates on the um, x-axis, and the blue is induced with IPTG, red, no induction. And so what you can see is that when you induce with IPTG, you get a lot of expression from uh, whatever the corresponding uh, promoter EGFP fusion was. For VizNR, it's PREM. Those are the ones in the middle. So these were all deemed to work well enough um, by our folks that we're going to help us do the screen that we're going to do a screen. So the question here is, can we inhibit that EGFP fluorescence? So when you're inducing expression of the activator turning on EGFP, can you see the fluorescence drop? And this was done um, in collaboration with the Stanford High Throughput Bioscience Center. And we're grateful to David Solo Cordero, the director there, um, a really good guy with a lot of experience in industry and academia and high throughput screening. And he did a lot to help us um, you know, design the screen and also did a lot of the analysis. Um, I highly recommend the HTBC at Stanford. It's run as a service center, so you don't actually have to be affiliated with Stanford to, um, to use it. And you can check them out at htbc.stanford.edu. And I had mentioned earlier that we don't want to select for compounds, or we don't want to screen for compounds 
that kill the cells. So our ideal inhibitor, we thought, was one that allows for cell growth, but it diminishes the EGFP fluorescence. And then it's also selective. We don't want to see it affecting all three regulators, right? Because there are different families there, almost certainly have different, um, would have different inhibitors, if any. Um, so we screened each strain um, against uh, more than 120,000 compounds, uh, and we measured both fluorescence, EGFP fluorescence, and culture growth. And so here, this one in A5, no change in EGFP. You know, that's most of them. We don't care about those. We also don't really care for this project about ones that inhibit the growth, right? You don't have any cells, you don't have any EGFP, but we don't want those. So what we want is we want ones where they're growing as well as without the compound or close to it, um, but no EGFP fluorescence. And we did find some. Um, we were on a little bit of a tight budget, so we sort of set a goal. We're going to take the maybe top 10 representative compounds and purchase and retest. Can't purchase all the compounds that are in these libraries, but you know, so we had to weigh that into the factor too. Um, and then we tried to confirm the inhibition. We also, just to make sure we were purchasing, you know, that we were sent the right things, we also did NMR to confirm, just proton NMR to confirm the, the structure of those. And so these, this is this example here. Again, it's with VizNR, and this is actually done in our lab, not in the HTBC, with 96 well plates. So the confirmatory experiments were done a little bit differently, you know, which I think you know, maybe gives them more credi credibility to do it two different ways. Um, and so this compound here, you can see on the y-axis, this is percent inhibition of EGFP fluorescence compared to the fully induced with no uh, controls, with no inhibitor. And then on the x-axis, micromolar concentration of compounds. So this compound, which is ChemDiv, um, that's the company that makes the, the library, compound number C5490604, um, shows a pretty good um, dose response curve. The IC50 for this compound was 0.7 micromolar. And that's for inhibition of EGFP fluorescence. Now, um, a lot of folks, in fact, when we submitted this paper for publication, every single of the three reviewers said, oh, why don't you test it on citrus plants? <laughs> so you need, should do that. Um, and it's actually really hard to do those kinds of experiments, just given the nature of citrus. A lot of different reasons. We also had very, you know, I don't know if this is just Murphy's Law, but of all the, co the 10 compounds we bought, this one that worked the best was the one we had the least of. And they couldn't synthesize more unless we, you know, threw in a big chunk of change to synthesize a lot more. So our compound was limited. Um, but yeah, we also, at Stanford, we don't have the facilities to be able to test any kind of disease um, processes on the plant. Um, so we thought, well, what could we do instead? Something that's a little bit different than just looking at EGFP fluorescence in case, what if this is some weird artifact of the EGFP? Um, although, you know, if it were, you think it would happen with the other strains and the same compound. So what we decided to do, because we know in SML Lodi that VizNR is a master regulator of motility, um, and it basically turns on the, rem, the PREM I talked about. The REM gene is actually another activator, and then that turns on genes that are essential for motility. So if you don't have VizNR and you're SML Lodi, you're not modal. So we thought maybe we can sort of leverage this knowledge to see if we can use an assay for the, you know, develop an assay for the compound that um, give us a little more evidence, but, you know, especially satisfy the reviewers. And so, um, we did determine that the Labyrobacter uh, VizNR expressed with IPTG from the inducible construct can substitute for SML Lodi uh, VizNR for motility. They're about 50% identical at the amino acid level. And this is a swimming motility assay. So basically, each one of these 
um, things in the lower panel there is a little small plate and it has soft auger. You can't turn these plates upside down like regular um, street plates. And you inoculate the bacteria in the center of the plate. And then over a period of days, they will swim through the auger. So that you're putting them a little bit below the surface and they swim out. So the wider the swim colony, the, wider, the bigger the diameter, the better they're swimming. And so you can see if you have wild type SMLOI in the first one, which is the vector, it swims fine. You knock out VizNR. The second one, it's not swimming at all. It's just staying right there in the center. You add back in your Labirobacter VizNR. Ghost works fine. It works just as well as adding back in the S. Melodi vis NR. So it's like, that's great. So we uh, did some teeny tiny plates with the last bit of compound we had. We were able to do four replicates of everything. And those results are shown in this graph here. And instead of you know, showing you the swim plates, looking at it this way, it's basically on the y axis, we're looking at the average swim colony diameter. And so the higher the, the column in the chart, the more it's swimming. And so if you look at the green bar, which is with the compound, well, with the compound on the right side versus the DMSO control on the left side. And you can see there's a significant, it's only 28% inhibition of motility as judged by the swim colony diameter, but it has a pretty good um, p-value over the, um, the replicates. And these are actually biological replicates too, not just technical replicates. So each inoculated spot is a different bacterial colony. So, um, so it worked pretty, um, pretty well. Um, and so that um, is actually kind of where we, I'm gonna end the talk pretty much, and this also ends our project. Um, we uh, probably won't be working on Labirobacter anymore in the near future, but we've contributed all the strains and results to the public domain to encourage broad use. Um, and we're grateful to both the both Stanford University and the Citrus Research and Development Foundation. Our, uh, it's a grower-supported um, uh, research foundation that they agreed to do that because you know we weren't the only parties to it. And I, th I think that's really not you know really good that they were able to do that. So. As far as um, the project, we showed that optimized S. melodi strains can reveal functions about Labirobacter asiaticus transcription activators. Uh, we were also able to use this system to identify small molecule inhibitors. These could start, you know, could serve as lead compounds or starting compounds, you know, to look for a, a treatment that would work, although, you know, in reality, usually the compounds have to be extensively, you know, studied, modified, whatever, because it's not just will it inhibit the disease in citrus, you have to worry like, does it get into the plant? Is it, you know, taken up in the right way? Um, but, uh, you know, we're hopeful. It's a really bad disease, and I think it's, you know, the finding a compound is not even going to be, you know, the cure or whatever. It's basically just, you know, uh, stopgap measures, right? The antibiotic use is just stopgap um, measures. Um, and I think, uh, I guess anyone working on Labirobacter or its close relatives, I mean, I'd encourage you to think about how... Um, you know, leveraging other model systems of related bacteria and collaborating with, uh, you know, across, you know, the field, you know, so Labirobacter to Sinorhizobium. There are also some groups that are doing Labirobacter stuff in Agrobacterium. Um, and I didn't really talk about Labirobacter crescens, which is the um, bacteria that's, um, of the Labirobacters that's kind of culturable. 
it's really come a long way since they first discovered it and the ability to do genetics and things that will make it a useful model system. And a lot of people who are getting into that are people who are like rhizobium and cyanorhizobium biologists. They're using their you know, skills with those systems to develop this new model. So I guess that's, that's my plug. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for your attention. And let's keep this beautiful, uh, citrus around for future generations to enjoy.